there, everyone. Welcome to Regarding Men, where we hold men in high regard and where red pill isolation comes to die. I'm Janice Fiamingo, and I'm joined today with my two comrades in arms, and they are Tom Golden of Men Are Good, and of course, Paul Elam of paulelam.com. And we have a special guest today who is Phil Bass. And Phil, is going to speak to us about his business. His business is the Doll's House, or sorry, the Doll House, which is not a um, Danish play uh, with a feminist theme, but is a, um, a company that manufactures and sells love dolls or sex dolls. These are um, realistic life-size dolls made out of a couple of different types of materials and um, they are, well, they have, have a variety of purposes as, as Phil will talk to us about, but you know, mainly they're there for sex. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we're gonna talk to, to Phil about how he got into this business and um, who his clients are and all that kind of good stuff. So um, welcome, Phil, thank you for agreeing to speak to us. And uh, maybe you could begin by telling our listeners a little bit about how you got involved in this business and how long it's been in operation and anything else about about your company that that um, you'd like to share thanks um well it's it's not particularly old as such i'm only going on for about five years of trading now mm -hmm. In terms of small businesses, that that's quite reasonable. It's it's gotten past that initial test of time, getting past the two year mark, yeah. where so many small businesses fail. Yeah. Um, and uh, back in the day, I was an IT worker. Um, I've kind of cut my teeth as an IT programmer, and because I was a bit of a chatty guy, uh, I kind of got promoted up because I could actually speak to various customers and things like that. Mm. And over time, I ended up as an implementation consultant, which I was being flown all around the world to implement operational risk solutions to large financial institutions. Mm. It sounds all very good, but... Um, you end up becoming a bit of a scapegoat and that this was starting to grind against me for a while. So I just thought, you know, I've got money in the bank, so I'm just going to take a year off and I have like a sabbatical, sit around and see what I want to do with myself. So after about 10 or so months, I started to think I'm going to need to start earning some money again. And I'd already had a sex doll by this time. So mm. I, I'm quite open with all things sort of sexual and stuff like that. I try not to hide anything as such. And I just thought, hmm, this might be worth a thing. Because I got my sex doll through an American company. And they just had it sort of shipped to the UK. And I thought, how many other UK companies are actually doing this? And there was only really one guy who was doing this seriously. So I thought, that looks like an opportunity. And I just thought, well, if I think about this for too long, I'm... I might miss the boat. So I just kind of thought, should I dive in? And I thought, you know, going from like a well-respected IT individual in the sort of financial IT arena, then moving to a sex toy vendor, you start to think, do I really want to be known as a sex toy vendor? <laughs> and I thought, what, what would my parents think? Um, <laughs> now my father he's just kind of pragmatic about it. He's really sex toys are you kidding me is this going to work and I was like well we'll see and my mother was just so unbelievably ashamed of the whole idea so right definitely doing this now <laughs> going in full steam and kind of since then I, I mean I, I did a few things I, I registered with dollforum.com it's like the world repository of all information's dealings with uh, dolls and even mannequins and stuff like that there's a various area for that so I got registered on there as a vendor that gave me a bit more um, exposure people would trust me because there was a lot of sharks in this uh, industry when I first started they've we've like netted a lot of them out so the, the industry is getting better but um once I did that, it was just sort of full steam ahead, and uh, I, here I am today. It's I, I, when I initially started, I just thought, 
let's see if this works to make me enough money to just kind of get by. I don't have to be rich or like have the sports car or the big house. I don't know. I just want to get by. And it's, it's given me quite a tidy little income as well, actually, as well as having other benefits in that um, it, this all happened very coincidentally, but everyone asked me, Phil, you're a MGTOW. So this, this looks very MGTOW-esque. Did you plan it like this? And it, and it just kind of happened that way. I, I tend to tell certainly younger men, don't try and create a business around like an ideal such as MGTOW or something like that. It's bound to fail. I, I just, it, it luckily happened this way for me, but I wasn't trying for it. Mm. Mm. So yeah. w- with all of that, I'm, I'm just here with you now. Yes. And you've got um, different places around the world, right? Not just in the UK. Yeah. I, well, I, I essentially started up like a, a small franchise system. So I've got a, a couple of outlets in the USA, um, so Florida, uh, Texas. There's also one in Mexico and I've got a, um, a newer one that's just recently started up, but is being hampered by, of course, the coronavirus lockdown in New Zealand. Hmm. You would think the lockdown might help it. You, you hear a lot about this. Yeah, and you can't it, go to where we get it. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I have seen like an uptick uh, in, in sales and stuff, but um, I noticed when people were going uh, like lunatics looking for toilet roll that, that my actual sales flatlined for about a week. And then once people got over the, uh, the mania for toilet rolls, then it, it picked back up. What, what the toilet roll's got to do with anything, I don't know, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, uh, and this is, you've already revealed a part of yourself that I wasn't aware of, and I'm, I'm glad for that. You identify as MGTOW, and you already had uh, even before, I, I guess it uh, became such a popular item these days, you already had a sex doll. Can you maybe share with us a little bit about what put you in that mindset? I mean, you're um, a good looking guy who, who I think obviously well, I can think attract so. women. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but as we know from talking to a lot of MGTOW that uh, just being able to attract women isn't enough in their lives. So I'm wondering what put you in this mindset of MGTOW and having a sex doll versus playing your, your odds in the regular dating market? Um, or did you do both? Uh, well, I mean, as, as a younger man, I spent like a lot of time chasing tail and so forth. And you kind of get burned a few times, but even as a younger man, I was, dare I estimate that perhaps I was somewhat red pilled anyway, because I, I, w- I was never under any illusion that I was going to allow myself to get married. I'd, I'd just never seen a happily married man before. And I had plenty of uh, married uh, relations in the family and stuff. It just always seemed to be a, more of a chore than a, like a great sort of uh, bounty to your life. And d- just that's how I kind of took it. And then I'd had a, a few living relationships with girls and it, it, there seems to be like a set period of time that you go through in a live-in relationship and then she just opens the faucet and lets all the crazy out in one go. And so I, I just kind of thought, you know, maybe this isn't for me. I mean, the MGTOW thing kind of came a lot. I must have been around about 2014, 2015 when I started to see it all explode around the internet and so forth. And uh, when I was looking it up, I was, oh, so I'm MGTOW. I didn't realize Yes. And I, I guess that's how, I mean, I've had a, a few other red pill guys kind of say similar things. And I bumped into older guys on my travels who are every bit the card carrying MGTOW, but have never heard the acronym at all. Exactly. Yes. Absolutely. What percentage of your customers do you think are MGTOW? Um, I would say a good 35, 40% definite because they'll actually say like, oh, Phil, I saw you online. Um, I've, I've, I've seen you um, speaking with the turd flinging monkey and he's like, he's a big cheese in the MGTOW world. Huh. Um, so, that, but there may be more than that because there's a lot of people who will just simply use the web form, order the doll. There'll be a little flurry of emails going backwards and forwards just to say when things will be ready. And that's as much uh, communication as I have with some of the customers. Yeah. So th- th- they could be like re- real die hard red pillars for all I know. And it's, it just passes me by. Right. But the guess is at least a third. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. 
And, I, mean, and it's, I, I can imagine it's hard to tell sometimes because as we find out, there's probably more MGTOW who don't know their MGTOW than there are MGTOW who know their MGTOW. There's just a lot of guys yeah. that have just checked out and have not had exposure to the manosphere and to other, you know, more outspoken verbal elements of this. I want to ask a question about the dolls themselves, and I'm sure we all <laughs> want to ask lots of questions about the dolls themselves. Now, normally, when um, I hear the word sex doll, I'm an old fart, so I go back to the, you know, inflatable Annie and the the, the, the sort of weird-looking mop of clown's hair uh, <laughs> atop something that looks like if you let go of the cork, it'll shoot around like a like a, a balloon losing its air. Uh, obviously, we're not we're not talking about those at this point. So, what changes in technology? have come, I mean, I went through your website merely for educational purposes, and I <laughs> looked at every doll on there repeatedly, and this is some like fine artistic work. We're yes. not in the same world anymore. So can you give us some insight into the technology changes that allowed this business to emerge? Um, right, well, essentially, um, it was kind of born out of a mannequin factory. Mm. And of course, we know about the uh, the one child policy in China. And so they had this explosion of uh, male children. So you've got all of these unwed men, if you like. So there is a bit of a, that's a bit of a problem in China. And then this mannequin factory, who was getting so good at making mannequins, someone suggested them, why don't you actually make dolls for men who can't get wives? So you go, ooh. And they just thought, I, I can see the dollar signs just starting to appear yes. in the air. And it, yes. it, it just made the, like business sense to do this. So they, as a sideline of the business, they then just started doing that. And it's become so popular and they're going all over the world and so forth. It, it becomes a business in its own right. Now, initially, um, the, the dolls themselves um, were effectively mannequins, but they were made out of silicon. Um, and it's it's quite an expensive material. There's uh, a lot of the high grade silicons tend to come out of Japan, and Japan do it to an almost a clinical standard, and, and it does make it quite expensive. Now, what did happen was the um, the production of a, a substance called thermoplastic elastomer, um, and I tend to call this cheap man silicon. It's kind of very similar in that it's, it's got like a fleshy feel to it. It's nice and rubbery and so forth. And you can mold it. It's different to silicon in that silicon cures. You just can't, you have the liquid silicon and then you, you add the components to it and it cures to like a, a, a solid um, shape. Whereas with thermoplastic elastomer or TPE, as we abbreviate, that's sort of like hot injection molding. So you just heat that up like a plastic, if you like, and then leave it in a mold and you've effectively got it all. Now, when that started to come out, that was more than halving the price of going from a silicon doll to a TPE doll. So all of a sudden, what was going to cost somebody the, the, the price of a small car mm. was then dropping to the price of maybe a, a holiday. So you're saying, oh, well, I can actually do this. And a lot of guys dare I say, like in the red pill arena, will do their cost benefit analysis. How, what are the risks and the costs to like actually have a, a female spouse? And what are the cost savings going to be if I spend a couple of grand on a doll? And a lot of guys actually come up with this reasoning as though they're pioneering this great thought. And I've heard this like a thousand times mm -hmm. where guys are <laughs> saying, I am literally saving thousands by having this doll. I mean, it's, it's a sad state that we're in this point today where people have to feel like this. Because I mean, it, it, in a perfect world, that there would be no need for my business. And that would be so much better. But, uh, oh, harking back to what you were saying, Paul, about me going MGTOW, even if I hadn't had the whole MGTOW ideal in the first place, when Me Too became a thing, that's when I would have just tapped out and said, nope, it's just too yes. risky. Yes. Like 20 years from now, somebody could say I did something because I had a relationship with it. It's just like, no, I'm out. And a lot of guys are starting to say the same thing. So dolls, yes. it's not so much a luxury or a wise thing to purchase. They're starting to think this might actually be a necessity. Mm -hmm. mm. 
Well, yeah, so the t- I mean, you talk about the, the guys figuring the financial savings, but there's also the potential of, you know, preserving their freedom, their reputation, um, sometimes their lives, depending on how it turns out. And their psychological state, too. I mean, this is these dolls, I'm assuming, don't say no, you know? <laughs> Well, uh, they, just, they don't say anything. There you go. There's, that, that there's beauty in that. That's point that I'm curious about. <laughs> there have been activists in the UK uh, who have wanted to assert rights for sex dolls, sexual robotics, and oh, that's right. of course are putting forth the narrative that the reason we're making these dolls is because they can't say no so that men can fulfill their their urge to rape. I mean, have, you, have you heard any of this stuff in the realm of your work? I mean, does that come into play here? I know you just had a great exchange on J4MB with uh, a feminist. Um, I imagine this has come up before, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, all the time. It's uh, even people who are just slightly interested and in just maybe asking a question to get some more information will often ask this. Does this lead men to go on and rape like the whole idea of when we had the page three newspaper model in the UK like a couple of decades ago a topless woman and th- those models they got accused of saying that that's going to lead to other women getting raped when all of the empirical data kind of points in the other direction so it, it's kind of like one of those when I get asked that question it's like oh this old chestnut again kind of idea and yeah. if I could um a lot of the guys wouldn't like this. That every year we there's a doll meet in, in the UK it's for the EU. And this is how I actually get to know some of the doll owners actually face to face. We all bring our dolls and stuff and all the guys nerd out like with different outfits and wigs and stuff. But one of the things that you would notice with these people is that it's like the doll is like Gollum's precious. Like you yes. can't even yes. use bad language around the doll. And they, they're so nice to the doll and stuff as though it, it is like an actual real life princess yes. type of thing. It's so very important. Some of the guys even give them sort of personalities that they try and act out. It's like some of them have got like a bad temper and so forth. So you've got to be careful around Stella, for example. But mm-hmm. like, it, it's almost like you, you move around this whole community and you don't see any issues of misogyny or hate or violence or anything like that. Mm. It, it just doesn't happen. That's where I, where I would like to take these people and say, right, point to me to the example where this is promoting rape yes. or rape yes. culture or any of that lunacy. Yeah. So do guys ever have a problem getting excited with the dolls or is it a natural thing? I mean, is it lifelike enough where they, they automatically get excited? Well, it's, it will seem strange. Um, as you've gone through the website and you'll see there's like hundreds of these things. And what guys will do, that they'll generally just go in through and it's like, you know, that's a doll, that's a doll. And then when they get to one that actually, it almost leaps out of the screen at them. It like, like when you meet that perfect girl and she's like, yeah, she's got two arms, two legs, two eyes, nose and mouth. She's just like every other girl, but this one's special guys have the same thing with the doll as well and like when uh turd flinging monkey for example i i asked him do you want to review a doll and he took my hands off in the offering and he said it's got to be the 165 centimeter celestina she's great i love that his (laughs) his thing apparently is eurasians so half asian Uh half european and apparently that's what this doll looks like and again another example for the feminists look to what Ted Flinging Monkey has done with his doll on his YouTube channel. And he's actually got the doll being like a news correspondent and doing all the sex doll news and stuff like that. And you've got to be a bit careful because it, it, sometimes he has like a little bot which acts as Celestina's AI personality in the Discord server. And if you start getting a bit sort of racy with his TFM will shut you down kind of idea because he, <laughs> he's actually got this bond with the doll and he's, he's almost like a mate guarding kind of idea. Yes, yes. And I mean, I know it's all kind of projection and so forth, but it's all these things that men do for their significant other, they're quite willing to do with the doll. So it just shows you like how much of a, a black hole we've got in today's society yes. where men will need to do this with what is effectively an inanimate object. Isn't that a good point? Yeah, but the guys seem to get connected to the dolls easily. 
I mean, the ones that they like, they really like them and they take care of them and they become kind of a part of the family. The, the, there's a, a, an actual bond that actually happens because I've noticed, you, you wouldn't notice so yeah. much with a guy that just has one doll, but lots of guys will actually get themselves like a harem and type of thing. But there's always really? one special one kind huh. of thing. The one, the, whether it was the first doll he got, whatever it happens to be, yeah. but there's a special bond that he has. And, and you can see the tenderness that, you know, like say, when he's picking the doll up, he's extra careful not to hurt her. And huh. it's a doll, so it doesn't matter. But it's those men need that sort of like love in their lives. Yes. And the, 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 this yes. is where it's all going wrong. And the doll is f filling that female shaped void in their lives. Yes. You have any concerns, I mean, about that? And again, I'm not, I'm not even playing devil's advocate here. I'm just curious if you see the, the idea of emotionally attaching to an inanimate object, um, one that ultimately cannot reciprocate love or a human bond is do you see any issue uh with that uh, ultimately maybe coming to some kind of a dead end and again i'm not assuming this is going to happen at all i'm just curious if any of this has come up um not so much as yet i mean as there have been minor tiffs that have happened in the uh mig tower sphere over similar sorts of things people accusing people of getting a bit too connected to it all um and psychologically uh, as long as you can still actually think in your mind uh intellectually that yeah it's still a doll and yeah. that you're not you're not really over projecting that this is a, actually a real person then i think you're going to be okay and if you were one of those people who would do that i would think you might have had the psychological problem anywhere the doll has just brought it to the surface yeah, men for millennia have connected to objects they love. I mean, think about men in their cars or men in their guns. I mean, you, you really take care of those things. You get this connection with them in a different kind of way. Or their pets, their dogs, you know? Yeah, but I it's was like, asking in the context that none of those things are any way implied to be a replacement for human beings. Um, so, again, I think the question needs to be explored. Well, I don't think that they men think they are replacing human beings. I think they're seeing them as a means to an end. But okay. who knows? Who knows? I tend to feel that way, but maybe it, it appeals to the scientist in me that yeah, um, men are pretty smart. I, I would like to see a, a clinical study of such. Yeah, things. it'd be fascinating. I would too. Not that one will ever happen with any legitimacy, because if there is a clinical study, it'll be written by feminists. <laughs> the outcome will be predetermined because nobody's going to let legitimate empirical research flourish on this subject. Speaking of science, Phil, have you ever heard of the Uncanny Valley? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I use this an awful lot. And really? we're experiencing kind of this now um, where the dolls, uh, if I speak just about the faces as such, because the bodies, yes. they can be any sort of shape that you want. But the faces, where the uncanny valley really springs forth is you get so close to the, the human form, but yes. it's just not quite there, and it really right. freaks you out. It's like, yes. oh, man, that's frightening. Yes. You know, I tend to get that more from mannequin-like faces than I do with the doll faces, because, the, for example, Sino Doll have just released a new series of dolls called the RRS series. And these are their top quality. They do all the best painting and stuff. And it's getting to the point now, if you just looked at a photographic still of the doll, mm -hmm. and there's three uh, females there, and I said, right, which one's the doll? You'd have to look two or three times to be able to figure it out. Wow. So they're starting to overcome the uncanny valley. Wow. Now, I used to see this a lot um, in the USA. There's a, a manufacturer, Matt McMullen, who owns Real Doll. And he's very good at doing very bespoke uh, dolls for people. But I've seen a few of his works up close through that EU doll meet that I was telling you about. And some of those dolls just kind of like sent a cold shiver down my spine. So it yes. was uncanny valleying me quite hard. Yes, yes. And for those of you who may not know what we're talking about, the uncanny valley, it's this theory that's out there that says as a robot or a doll gets closer and closer to looking like an actual human, that there's this curve that goes on and we get closer and closer and closer, the more it looks like human. And then there's a point at which it drops and people get repulsed by it. But then if you keep going and you get closer and closer still, it goes back up again. 
Is that a good description, Phil? Yeah, well, we're, we're going to get like a, a double spike on this one. Yes, um, beca yes. Because the dolls will be, as I'm describing, they're getting better and better. Yeah. To a point where you won't be able to tell the difference between doll and human. Now, where this then uh, revisits the Uncanny Valley is going to be when we start using the animatronic heads and going full robotics. Oh, because God. the movements are so robotic and terrible. You can just, yeah, that, that's a robot. Yeah, I, I'm under no way, I'm under, under any illusion that that's a human being. Right. But then then we have to overcome that again once we've got like full facial muscles and stuff like that. Yes. And you, you then can't tell the difference between a ro uh, robotic newsreader and an actual human newsreader. Then you've overcome the, the, the uncanny valley again with respect to robotics. How close are we to that? we're still quite a, a way off. There's a lot of money being pumped into robots and it, it's, it, it, it sells it clicks in newspapers, but, so the media love it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, for good or for ill, they'll, sometimes they'll show like, you know, the, the true research that is going into doing robotics. Um, for instance, you, you will have noticed in uh, Japan, you, you have store greeters that will just stand at the front of the store and uh, greet you as you come in. Robots are being earmarked for that job and they're perfect for it. A little yes. bit of AI, and you could ask the store greeter, uh, which floor are the laptop computers on? And then the greeter will be able to tell you. And of course, you know, we, we don't have to have a person doing that. Yes. Because yes. in, in one way, we could, we could argue that that's a demeaning role for a person. But what we're doing with robotics, we're going to be like replacing the manual labor of humans before long. Yes. Not with so much respect to sex robots or anything like that, but right. just right. robotics in general. Yes. I gotta ask a question. How do you clean them? Um, well, we'll be talking about um, the vaginal cavity, no yes. doubt, right? One of the cavities, I suppose. Yeah. Um, well, for this particular cavity, you do get two options. You can actually have just what they call the fixed, which is just exactly as a human, or you can have the removable has an insert, which actually just pulls out. And then you can walk that off to the bathroom clean that as you will. Now, assuming that you've got the fixed, because that was where your question was coming from. We're, um, with all of the dolls, you're kind of um, supplied like a, a douche that you can fill up with soap and water and then just, and then that? that blasts the, the soap and water in and everything then comes out and you catch that. So men have to learn how to douche. How about that? <laughs> it's Well, actually it's amazing because um, <laughs> I've seen some very masculine men yeah. who, who are now who've, they're open about having dolls, so they're not secretive about it, but they'll now start openly having conversations about makeup techniques and stuff like this. Oh. So it's bringing up like a huge feminine quality in yes. men, and yes. they seem to love it. You'll see the men like combing the hair of the doll and stuff, and they're, they're like a mother, like just making sure everything's perfect. And yes. it's, it's opening up what I consider the feminine side of men. Well, now, could you buy a doll and buy multiple vaginas? Yes. The, so the, you could have a, a group of these... house, and each guy would have his own vagina. In theory, this is what a lot of the brothel uh, entrepreneurs have been doing. Interesting, interesting, yes. And oh. I've, I've had a number of questions from a, a few people who've wanted to run a sex doll brothel. Really? And they, they always get tripped up by the fact, I don't need to go through all of the extra red tape because these are not actual women. I've told each of these people, run the sex doll brothel as though it is an actual brothel. So then you've passed all, you've got all of the licensing, you've jumped through all of the fiery hoops, then they can't close you down as easy because these people always get caught up in a technicality of legality and they get closed down. Now, interestingly, you'd be thinking if, uh, say it was me, I'm running a sex doll brothel, this is going to vastly uh, reduce the number of people who are uh, trafficked for sexual needs. So yes. surely this is a great thing, right? But then right. feminists turn out in droves to argue the point, the women can't earn uh, a sex dollar because of these dolls, because the dolls are now becoming more popular than the women. Now, it, it's like you're caught between a rock and a hard place there, because then I'm just tempted to ask, feminists, what do you want? It's like you, you, got, you blow hot and then cold and you contradict yourself. Just have some consistency, please. Yes. <laughs> you know, along those lines, I wanted to ask you too, just your impressions of what do you think it says about the current state of affairs between men and women that we now have an entire industry built on replacing women? I mean, and let's call this what it is. Mm. I mean, this, these guys are 
either because they experience a lot of sexual rejection or because they have had such hor horrific experiences with women in their lives, any number of reasons, but whatever it boils down to, they're investing uh, a, a few thousand dollars in, into something to replace women in their lives. And is this, should this be a wake up call to women about what they bring to relationships and how they treat men in relationships? I've had the question from women regarding this type of thing. Mm. And so why are men going so do lally crazy over sex dolls? I mean, that me and my friends, we're, we're all better looking than those dolls. We can do more things. I said, yeah, perhaps it's in the doing things bit where you're kind of going a little awry because all you've got to do is do one thing that's a benefit to a man's life and you out-trump any doll that has been created thus far. And But what you all seem to be doing is you counterbalance this with a whole load of other grief-stricken uh, activities which just, it just lowers, tips the balance more towards the sex doll. And the doll doesn't do anything. It doesn't say anything. It doesn't have any needs. I mean, from what I've been describing about the dolls, it, it's like the men like caring for the doll. It, it's yes. like that sort of masculine love if you, you know, to protect and care yes. for and stuff like that. It's, that's the void in their lives that they're wanting to go for. And it's, it's just becoming, well, I think it's becoming too dangerous for men to necessarily just jump feet first into a relationship and just see how it goes. But there was a guy came down to the dollhouse. He was interested in dolls. He wanted to talk to me and we nerded right out. We're talking about robotics and engineering and stuff. And I think because he'd had a flashlight before, if you know the sex toy I'm talking about, I thought, well, I looked at this guy and said, well, you're, clearly intelligent. I mean, you're at university, you're looking as though you're going on post-grad as well. You're a good looking guy. Like what's the deal with you and women? They say, oh, I'm still a virgin. This guy couldn't get it. There was nothing wrong with this guy. I mean, you know, he could hold a good conversation, clearly intelligent. Like he had means, everything that you would think a woman wants, but the, the, the younger women of today, just seem to be on this crazed march for the top 1% of men. And they think they're good enough. Like, I blame L'Oreal for this. You're worth it. It's just, it <laughs> seems to be out of control. Yes. Yeah, we're pumping narcissism into our women, you know, and into our culture, actually. But it's crazy. So I don't know if dolls actually are the solution but the, the, there might just be like a band-aid or a stopgap until we actually get a true solution. Yes. That's a good and, point. and Phil, you mentioned before we started talking that uh, there have been efforts to shut you down, that you've had visits from the police and all that. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yes. That, that's joyous time in my life in 2018. <laughs> um, I had just moved. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm living where I am today. It's, that that was the move. So um, for what had actually happened in the first instance, I'll start at the start. A doll had been seized by UK Border Force, or Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. And someone somewhere deemed this is a child sex doll, even it's got like double D breasts and big hips and stuff. But, you know, they went on the height. So... National Crime Agency was involved. They've got a search warrant for where I live and for the lockup unit that I use for the dollhouse. So when they turned up at my old address, I wasn't there. And my oh. neighbor had to say, oh, Phil just lives up the road. You can walk up there and find. So they called me up on the phone and they said, can we come and speak to you? Said, yeah, sure. And then they were asking questions like, can we search your premises? We did have a search warrant for the old place, but that that doesn't count. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They seized all of my uh, computer equipment and electronic equipment m minus one laptop to keep the business still going. But they, they scanned that laptop and it was, they took my phone. I was like, really? I could really do with the phone for work. And so, well, we noticed you've got one of the old brick Nokias in your bedroom. And that's when I, ah, I get it. They're looking for child porn. That's what, that's why they don't want the old Nokia, they want the smartphones, anything that can turn videos or images. Uh -huh. So they, it took them about six, seven months to sweep through everything, oh, by which time I, I got myself like you know, a decent London-based solicitor. And uh, we lent on them and 
because effectively in the UK, what they're using, there's a 200 year old law, which is very nebulous and broadly defined. And it was put in place to stop um, hardcore printed pornography from coming in the country at that time, which is something that was a thing back then. But because it's, they just describe or define something as just being obscene, it is then therefore illegal to import. Now, this is the weird thing in the UK. You can actually have a child sex doll. It's not illegal to own one. It's not illegal to have one or buy one, but it is illegal to import one, which is crazy. I'm like, I would much rather the UK authorities got themselves together and actually define some true legislation to deal with all of this. So anyway, I had six, seven months of waiting for my equipment to come back. I spoke to one of the UK vendor who's had exactly the same problem. Wow. Again, just looking for child porn. So like they go through it, they find nothing and then they drop the case. But Jeez. you know, that, that costs you like nearly 20,000 US dollars in legal fees and whatnot. Easily. So they can just, if they want to, they can just keep on hammering at you with that until you're out of business. So I would just, just get the House of Commons together get some legislation put in place. Cause I would sooner that there was legislation, things def uh, definitively saying, these are the criteria that uh, create a child doll. And if we want to make that illegal, we're going to, you, you need to be able to just run a simple set of tests and say, does it pass or fail? That's what I want from revenue and customs. Because oh. now revenue uh, and, of, and customs, um, they're operating to a different set of ideals that the National Crime Agency were. So the National Crime Agency told me anything that's 140 centimeters or low, four foot seven, we're just going to deem as a child doll, irrespective of the qualities that it has. So I was like, okay, I don't agree with it, but I can work with that. Right. So that's, that's why there are no 140 centimeter dolls on my UK site. Huh. Now I've had a 150 centimeter doll uh, seized by revenue and customs. Now this one's just like a sh fraction of an inch beneath five feet. So I think it's a reasonable height. It's, you know, it's got a bountiful breast, hips. It does have an oriental looking face, whereas a lot of these do. And I just think Western customs officials will just deem that as being young because it's oriental. So yeah. I'm taking them to court this time to see if yeah. I can actually get some criteria yeah. put in place for the rest of the industry. Oh, there's an actual case there that you're taking to court with them? Yep, yep. I'm, I've, because of this seizure of this doll, I'm, I'm querying the legality of the seizure. So we're going to have to go through it piece by piece to see what was actually uh, legal or illegal in this mm -hmm. case in the seizure. Because where the problem is coming from, we've got this nebulous obscenity law, and it's just taking one customs official to say, I think that looks like a child. Right. And, you know, you, you could s a set of knives and forks being imported in the country. They go, oh, I think that's obscene. So therefore that's illegal. So you, you're going to get abuse of power if you allow customs officials to have this. So it needs to be written down. Yes. Yeah. Wish you the best of luck with the yeah, man. government to develop a clear set of standards. You know. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's <laughs> almost the impossible task or Herculean task to do. But the, the fact is the rest of the other UK vendors are so mortally afraid of uh, standing up to the UK authorities that they won't do anything. Huh. Like if the goalposts keep moving, let's say they just kept it on height and it went from 150 to 160 and then to 170 centimeters, then you're getting like taller than men now. Yeah, and right. they could just keep moving these goalposts. So then, yes. then there's no more industry. And say, so, well, you know, if you're going to kill the industry, you're going to kill jobs, then therefore people are going to be on benefits. And then the money all comes back to you guys. So it's in your own best interest to legislate this. Gynocentrism runs deep. And it Indeed runs it quiet. does. It's all emotional thinking. That's the problem. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Where you think this <clears throat> may be going, where are we going to be with, with sex dolls, sexual robotics in 10 years? In 10 years, we might actually be getting to what I would call an acceptable position to, in terms of realism. But what I would like to hope for is that robots become so ubiquitous that you just think of it as the robot. You're not thinking this is, oh, my, my wife or my significant other or something like that. It may deal with some sort of nocturnal activities for you. But, you know, in much the same that your room cleans your floors. It's just that kind of thing. It's just a thing. Oh. I know some people won't actually 
um, go go along those routes. But I, I think those people have probably got some psychological issues before sex dolls. It's just bringing it to the fore. But maybe that's me hoping for the best. Uh, I don't know. Oh, you're a good source. You're a good source. Are we about there, guys? I think we are. I think it's one thing seems evident to me. Sex dolls are not going away, folks. I mean, that's a good thing. For the feminists, uh, yes, absolutely. For the feminists out there that think they're somehow going to put a stop to the advance of technology, I've got Forget to about it. for you. That's been tried on a million other things before. Technology it takes on a life of its own. Yes. And I don't think there's any stopping this. Uh, Phil, I want to thank you for being willing to sit down and talk yeah. with us about this so openly and honestly. I feel like I got to know you a little bit in the course of this conversation. Mm -hmm. and that's I agree. And thank I want to thank you for the work you're doing because it really is helping men. Yeah. You know, it's really helping men. So thank you, you know, for what you're doing. Take, There'll be plenty of links below, by the way. Yeah. And let's take 30 seconds for that. You said something before we started, Phil, about the reactions of some of your customers and the difference that these devices have made in their lives. Can you just share with us for a few seconds about yeah. that? Um, that often people will just come back to say, oh, thank you, got the doll, everything's really good. But I'd say in about one in 15, maybe one in 20, a guy will come back and say, this doll has just so changed my life. Yes. It's fantastic. It's everything that I thought it was going to be. But then the, the, the most important nugget he just left at the end, it feels like I've been made happy for the first time. Oh, That's when you know I that you're mean, making a difference. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and yes. Absolutely. They're yeah, well, good. Wrong men are good. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, thanks so much, Phil. I mean, it, it would have been, uh, it, in many cases, I assume that it would have been possible to interview someone who has this as a business and is simply an expert in, in making these dolls and selling them and advertising and everything. But in you, we found somebody who can also uh, speak with insight and deep thoughtfulness about all of the philosophical and cultural issues that uh, the fact of these dolls and men's relationships with them, um, you know, ha has produced. And, and so I, I really appreciate that. You've given me a lot to think about. Thank you. I want to remind everybody, also a link below, sign up for the Regarding Men newsletter, <laughs> sign up for the Regarding Men groups. We're going strong seven days a week right now yeah, with man. discussions for men. And this topic would be as welcome as any other. Uh, with that, we're going to wish you guys a great day and we'll see you next time. All right. Uh, and again, we have Phil. to end by saying that <laughs> men are, are <laughs> good. <laughs> Okay, have a great week, everyone. Thanks we'll again. We'll see you. Bye-bye. You too.